emergency crime and train, obviously 911 is appropriate. Uh, there's also, is, there's a list of sheets over there with all our numbers. If you see something that's just, uh, just hey, I have a guy who's camped out here. The way that we're dealing with it right now is through our homeless average team and through our community policing teams. We're trying to not have patrol um, deal with that person who just camped out because there's so much that goes into actually enforcing that law. So, and I'll just give you the example. If we go out, if there's a guy with a tent in Maxwell Park today, right now, and we go out there, in order for us to enforce that camping ordinance that we have, we have to offer him outreach, right? Hey, we have a shelter, and if he says, let's say he straight says, no, I'm not going to a shelter. I have to make sure that not only is there a shelter bed available for him, but it's, with, it's in compliance with everything that he needs. So if he's camped out there with a dog, and he has a bad back. I have to make sure that there's a male bed available that will take a pet and has a bottom bunk for him that works for him. If I have all three of those things and he will not go to the shelter, then I'm able to hold him accountable for that ordinance. If I don't have those things that he needs, I cannot cite him for him and he's going to stay where he's at until I do have all those three things to where we're able to address him. And so that, because it's so complex and it changes every day, at 10 o'clock today, I constantly get up and get emails on how many beds are available at this shelter, how many beds are available at that shelter. So at 10 o'clock, if there was eight beds available, but I don't contact this guy till four, I have to recontact them and make sure that I have a bed available before any enforcement can take place. And we talked about it in the early meeting, so this may be deja vu for people that were here. It's just a whole transition in how we police. Right? We have found that it is way more beneficial to assist someone and help them get off the streets and get back on their own feet and help them be productive in society again than just incarcerating them time and time again. Right? Now don't get me wrong, if they don't want to go with the program and they don't want to follow the rules that we have, then we will incarcerate them if we have to. Right? That's then that's part of the approach is there is an enforcement aspect but um, one of the things that we really look at is kind of the crimes that they're committing how we approach it and I, again our approach to it is i think somebody said last meeting shelter or jail that is not that is not the way we do things at all there's actually three options you can go to the shelter or you can be in compliance with the laws that we have in place. And if you're not in compliance with those laws that we have in place, then we can hold you accountable through enforcement. And I'll give you the example. The guy who doesn't want to go to the shelter, who just wants to sit on the bus bench all day long, but doesn't have a lot of property, there's nothing wrong, there's nothing illegal with that. There's no enforcement aspect. So I think some of the misinformation that gets sent out is if you call dispatch because, hey, there's a homeless guy sitting on the bus bench and I don't like it, dispatch may tell you, hey, there's nothing we can do. Well, that's not necessarily true. There may be no enforcement aspect that we can do, but what we can do is go out and contact him and offer him services, whether it's our drug rehab that we have, whether it's um, the PER team we talked about. Maybe he has some mental illness and he needs to be evaluated by a psychologist, or maybe he just needs resources and we offer him the resources. But at the end of the day, it's his choice whether he wants to accept those or not. And if he chooses not to, but he's still in compliance of all the laws that we have in place, then it's okay for him to be there. He's there. Well, they're not staying, but what if they're sleeping on the park? Yeah. What if he's sleep on the park bench? And the handicapped the person lane. wants to come along and sit on that bench and wait for the bus. Now, and he's sleeping on it. In my opinion, he should probably make room for them to sit, right? But there, he's, 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 allowed, he's allowed to be there. I, there's no he's law. He's allowed to sleep on it. What about with the school kids? We live near Dale and all. And that one he's, corner. These are, these are my laws. I know. I'm just telling no, you exactly what, what we can do, right? That's okay. and, that's, and that's part of the having these meetings is providing an educational part too. Because to me personally, I don't think it's right if you take something more <laughs> and can use it. But do I have the authority as a police officer to make and change his actions? And the answer is no, I don't. Well, what about what's when it involves the school children and those guys that camp on the new bike trail now, if they're camping, and they're walking? Right. So, are you talking about like Schweitzer Park? 
No, I'm talking about Stony Brook. Right and, and Edison. So if they're camping yeah. with tents and property, yes, so um, that's something we, yes, we can address that absolutely. But I call, when I call about it, I stress the fact that dozens of school children are going to be walking by And, and a bike trail is a whole, a whole <laughs> other aspect because it's a class one bike trail, so there are different laws that apply to people just loitering on the bike trail part sitting on the bike trail. So the bike trail is a whole different aspect than just a public place. The bike trail is different. So there are laws that we can address the bike trail just for people hanging out. So if you call, and again, the homeless outreach that we're on there, if you call them, call Sergeant Rozo, or if you have my two bells on there too, that you get a hold of me if we can come out and do this. They seem to when I call, unfortunately, but it happened three times in one week when I go by there at 7 o'clock in the morning walking. No, and I'll tell you, one, one of the things that we dealt with, that we'll kind of give you an example of like how, how we see things and how things are different. So the Schweitzer Bridge, everybody knows the Schweitzer Bridge, right? I sat there with Lieutenant Friesen one day and walked, watched the kids try to go to school and walked the gauntlet of the campsites and, and dogs barking at kids when they're going and you know, it was awful. But at the time, we didn't have a tool to deal with that. What we found out is that that walkway is actually owned by the Millmore Apartments. And the city just has an easement for pedestrian traffic. So we have an easement for people to walk through there. So what we did is work with the city attorney we talked to him, hey, since this property is technically owned by the Biltmore, can they have a 602 letter just like any other private business? And then we give people a warning that if they're camped out on this area, we just set up. Because what happened was they were camped out, but with not enough property or a tent that would justify the camping component, right? They were just on the cusp, right? Because you're smart. If you get arrested for camping, you kind of figure out what you can and can't. So now they're there, but we don't have the camping component, but now we have a trespassing component. So the way our trespass program works, that any um, business can do this, they file a letter with us saying, hey, we don't want people trespassing. What we do is we go out and we contact them. They get one warning. So if you're sleeping at the front bench of Kentucky Fried Chicken at night, and I go out there and they have a trespass letter, I will contact you, and then you get a warning saying, hey, you know you're not allowed to be on this property if you go. If you come back to that property, then you're subject to being arrested for trespassing. So that's what we did with that walkway is technically owned by the Biltmore. And we just have to be very careful how we enforce it, right? I'm not gonna give somebody a trespassing arrest just because they're walking through, right? That's not right, I think we all agree that's not right on either end. That law is set up for the people who are camped out, blocking the path for kids going to school, or anybody else using it to get to the park. So those are the different things. And while we're on the trespass, we'll talk about this too. Let's see. Gas station, so let's say the church you know has a trespass letter. And you drive by and you see somebody sleeping on one of their sidewalks within the church. If you call the police department, back up. You can call the police department, but it's ultimately the property owner that has to be the one that tells us they don't want them there. You cannot call for somebody else. Quick hey, question. Right? Yep. Yes, I'm Jose. Unless you're security, you have to have some kind of vested interest for them, right? You already answered the question. There you go. There you go. You have to have some kind of vested interest. So if you're security for a property, you can do that, right? You obviously have a contract, you're working for somebody. But let's say, what's your first name? Genevieve. And your first name? Gina is driving by Genevieve's. What kind of shop do you want to have today? She has a McDonald's. So she goes and there's somebody there and she says, you know what? I'm gonna call the police department for her. So she calls us. The first thing we're gonna do is call her and make sure that she wants them to be prosecuted. Because it's their property that they're in charge of. Right? Now if you have a private security, they can come around on your behalf and press charge on your behalf. But you cannot make somebody leave somebody else's property. And so we get hundreds of calls a month for people calling for other people's property. And so that's part of the educational process of knowing. Now what we ask people to do, if you see, and I'll give you the example, Rainbow Donuts. Everybody knows Rainbow Donuts at Beach and Lincoln, right? And you have people sitting on the curb, or on their planter. Technically, by definition, they're trespassing on their planter, but in order for me to enforce anything, they have to have Rainbow Donuts call me. And you know how many times, now I'll tell you I get it, Roughly 10 to 15 calls a week. Call the 
uh, police department. So church is an interesting one, right? So generally we would have whoever the board of trustees for the church, whether it's a pastor or whoever runs it, would fill out the letter and they can designate people that can do it on their behalf because realistically, right, you could have 300 people from the congregation be all responsible for notifying us, but there's that one person we're going to contact or a group of people we're going to contact. <coughs> and that's an easy thing, right? So let's say you do have a 500 person congregation, you encourage everybody to call. That's fine, but all the police department's going to do is call some of those people that are entrusted to make decisions for them and just verify hey, um, make sure you don't want anybody on this property. That's great and tell the people that are the ones that we're supposed to contact, we can't get a hold of them. Then it becomes a problem, right? So. Can I ask a question? What yes. if I go on vacation and I have a young kid or somebody else there at my house, would it be best for me to fill out a, what do you call it, a system for, too? For residents, it's different okay. than a business, right? And so the best way I can explain it, let's say the 24 hour uh, gas station. For the 602 letter to be in place, we really put the onus on that business to be involved in the process for us coming out for 602 codes and that that's part of the agreement we have. So we can and our city attorney will file county codes for us. So the best way to do that, if you call dispatch again, they're probably gonna refer you to the county. But if you want us, the Anaheim Police Department come out, notifying the homeless outreach hotline leaving a message on there. It generates an email that goes to the sergeant of that detail. I have and he'll put email. it on his list for us to go out to. Now granted, your space is one of, they have the whole city, Yeah. right? Mm -hmm. So we just talked about it. There's people living in caves out on Weir Canyon and Gypsum Canyon, Ooh. right? So just remember that that whole unit responds out to Gypsum Canyon in the 91 mm -hmm. and all the way to not Mall or not in uh, Lincoln. So understand how big of an area, so they may not get to it that day you put it in, but as long as it's on our list, we will get to it. I will say I emailed um, Cooper? No, I'm Cooper. Sorry, Cooper. You're Cooper. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> okay. Cooper. Okay, well, I emailed you on a Sunday and you responded to me, so yes. I totally appreciate that, and they were gone by that week. The response time is... There's still okay. some lingering stuff. So I'm gonna tell you a little secret about my response time. You guys aren't allowed to tell anybody. Not only am I the West uh, Community Policing Sergeant, I'm also in charge of all our negotiators for the whole city. So I'm on call all the time and don't get to turn off my phone. Whoa. So It's a shame for you, but really good for us. Let's yeah. hear it for Cooper. <laughs> so, so what's funny is, um, just on that note, there was an email string that went back and forth and they were very upset with me that I didn't type back to them and somebody forwarded it to me. So I did tell them, I answered their question and I ended it with P.S. Yes. You can't get mad at me if I don't reply if I'm not on the email chain. I saw that. That wasn't me. 